All right, let's look at hand activation or hand activated and ultrasonic instrumentation. When we say hand activated, what we're referring to is manual instrumentation. So using our instruments that you guys learned in preclinic, ultrasonic instrumentation that refers to cavitron or piezo. So when we um, instrument, or when we debride, rather, um, our clients, so the main reason why we're debriding our client is to, for periodontal health. We want their health, their oral health, to um, be good and be healthy and, and, you know, not have any disease, no gingivitis, no perio. So hand instrumentation, or um, actually any type of instrumentation, is very important. What I must say is that when we are determining what type of instrumentation to use, whether it be hand versus um, ultrasonic, it's important that, um, let's say someone has like lots of heavy calculus, in their in their mouth you want to use a mix okay so what i want you guys to understand is that we shouldn't just use cavitron and that and not follow up with the manual hand debridement we must use a mix we can use completely you know all hand debridement that's fine we can use all manual instrumentation but if we choose to um, use a cavitron or a piezo we must supplement that with hand instrumentation so let's look at our basic instrument design. We have a handle. The handle is what you're holding. We have a shank. The shank is the area in between the handle and the working end. And we also have the working end, which is right here. So again, we have the handle. The handle is the area, the, the, the area or the part that you are holding. The shank is the area from in between the handle and the working end. And the working end, this is from the terminal shank, and I'll go over the different types of shank, but the terminal shank to the, the working end, to the very tip or to the very um, toe. This working end, the working end is basically defined as the area that comes into contact to the um, tooth or the area that comes into contact with the teeth. Okay, so that is your working end. Now, when we're looking at the shank, there are two types of shank. There's a functional shank. Actually, this whole thing is a shank. And then there's also a functional shank and a terminal shank or the lower shank. And the way to differentiate the functional shank from the lower or terminal shank is that this shank, the functional shank, starts from the first um, bend to the very end of the working end or to the very end of the or, or of where the working end starts and the lower shank or the terminal shank starts at the last bend or the last curve up to the working end okay so functional shank is the um first bend which we see here is the first bend all the way to the working end the lower shank or terminal shank is the last bend up to the working end now when we look at the handle um you can see this very different uh types of material that the handle can be made from. Some of them are very small, some of them are very large, some of them have texture or knurling, um, some of them don't, some of them are um, solid so they feel heavy, some of them are hollow where it feels lighter. So hollow is better, if it feels lighter, it's it's less strenuous on our hands. Um, we like to see texture for knurling um, like this because it doesn't slip off of our hand as we're debriding. We like seeing large uh, grip. So this is a larger grip is better than a thin, small um, type of handle because um, it's more comfortable to hold and it also leads to um, less cramping. If you use a small one, you're more prone to cramping your hand to cramp, that is. So here's a question for you guys. Which of the following instrument designs is best used for accessing a deep perio pocket on the proximal surface of a maxillary permanent first molar? So we're using, we're looking at the maxillary um, first molar. We want to access the proximal surface. We look at the mesials and distals. Which one is the best area? It's a deep perio pocket. The answer is A. The more angles your shank is, the more bendy your shank is, the better. Because when you have an angled shank with a complex bend, it is easier to access the deep area pockets on the posterior teeth. We're looking at posterior teeth. So the more posterior you go, the more angled 
and complex bend you want. If it's more in the anterior, then the small you just need like a you don't need an angle. You can have a straight shank with you know one or one bend with a single bend if it's for anterior teeth. But if it's for posterior teeth, you want an angled shank where the shank is tilted or angled and complex bend. So let me show you what that looks like. So remember, this is our shank, and the lower shank is from the last bend to the very tip of the or to the very you know beginning of the working end. And um, just something to keep in mind is that we have this is our regular size shank, and sometimes, and I'll show you later on, you can get um, a long shank. Where what do you think this would be good for? Why would someone want to have an instrument with a long shank? Yeah, the long shank. If you're thinking is to access the deep pockets your pockets you would be correct so if you want to go deeper in the sulcus you would probably want a longer shank so that you're able to go in a lot more deeper so this is a short shank this could be considered a long shank this long shank is good for deep perio um, probing depths even recession sometimes long shanks are good um, even if you sometimes if you want a fulcrum um, in an area you want to you want to debride the tooth and fulcrum further away from that area so if you have a long distance from um, the, your fulcrum to the area instrumented you would want a long shank this is what it looks like with a simple shank where it's just bent in one place um, where, whereas a complex shank is could be bent in like one or two places and so complex shanks are good for posterior teeth like this premolar here, whereas simple shank is good for anterior teeth that we see over here. When we look at the working end, and remember the definition of a working end is, is basically from the terminal shank to the end of the instrument that comes into contact with the um, tooth or with the tissue. And so this is the base right here, which is the innermost surface of this curette. The back is, I can show you the back, the back is the opposite, so the face is in right here, the back is on the opposite side, and then this lateral surface, these are the surfaces on either side of the face, so this is, there's one on this side and there's one also on the other side. There's also a cutting edge, the cutting edge is the sharp edge, and that sharp edge is where the lateral surface and the face meet, then um, curettes have toes at the end, sickles have tips at the end. We even have paired and unpaired instruments. So look at this one. This is unpaired because when you look at the working end, it's very different, right? This is a sickle and this is another instrument, another kind of until probably a, a curette on this side. So it's not the same. This is paired where this instrument or this working end look is the mirror image of the other working end so one side could be used on specific side of the mouth and the other side could be used on other sides of the of the client's mouth so it's just a mirror end of the working end which is considered paired unpaired is when you have two different instruments on each side now when you are classifying instruments you can classify them by assessment instrument which are these three over here we use a mirror we use a probe and we use explorer for assessment and then the other instruments are for treatment so this is what you're using for calculus removal scaling debriding root planing that's what all that is for so we can see here we have um, this is a file um, this is a hole, and we'll look at that it's basically to break down chunks of calculus. Then we have a sickle, and we have a curette. There are many different types of mirror. There is the front surface mirror, so it's like this, which is um, where the mirror reflection is on the front um, of a flat glass, and it's a clear, you see a clear reflection, clear image, there's no distortion, it doesn't look, you know, magnified, or it doesn't look like it's less, not magnified. So this is a front surface, this, the only disadvantage with this is that it does scratch easily, this area can scratch easily. The concave surface, which is this one right here, the mirror reflection is on front of a curved glass, so it's concave, like it's like a curved glass, and so when you're looking at the reflection, it's magnified, the, the teeth look bigger, so it's a magnified image. We also have the flat or the plane surface, and this is where um, the mirror reflection is on the back of a flat glass. And this one is actually pretty good because you don't really get any um, scratching with this one. So you do get scratching of the surface on the front surface, but you don't really see scratching on the flat surface. 
So mirrors are great because they have four different functions. I'm going to show you those right here. So we can see that this one, the mirror is used to retract the buccal mucosa. So retraction is one um, thing that the mirror can do. Another thing a mirror can do is indirect vision, where if you can't see an area, you look at the mirror to see the area. So you're looking at it indirectly. There is indirect illumination. So illumination stands for light. So here we can see light being shown in that area. And then lastly, we have trans illumination, where you're basically uh, making light travel through the teeth to see if there's any cavities for example sometimes you can see some shadows through the light so that's trans illumination so four different functions of the mouth mirror we have explorers too and you can see here there's so many different types of explorers we have the pigtail we have the 1112 which is the one you might be familiar with so many different types of um, explorers and we know what they're used for right they're used to detect calculus they're used to detect caries they're used to see if there's any irregularities if the margins of the restorations the fillings are not smooth the explorer can detect that through tactile sensitivity we also have this previous slide said probe is another assessment um, instrument and last, there's actually a question on this so which of the following instruments is best designed for assessment of vocation involvement vocation involvement what probe do you use for vocation involvement yeah it's the neighbor's probe okay so the neighbor's probe and i'll show you a picture of it it's a specialized probe that is used for um, detection and also classification of vocations it has like a curved shank, it has shaded markings, um, it has a blunted tip, so it's really good for subgingival insertion and it's also really good to, you know, figure out what classification of vacation your client has. So let's look at the different types of probes. So we have the Marquis probe and if you look at this probe, you can see that it's um, spaced apart every three millimeters. So we have three millimeters, six millimeters, nine millimeters and 12 millimeter marking. The tip is very, very thin, so it's really important that one of the considerations it's saying here is that be very gentle because you can really poke or penetrate through the junctional epithelium if you put too much pressure. So be very gentle because the, the tip is very thin. We have the Williams probe, and I know it is not clear, but there is measurements of um, it goes like one, two, three, and then there's no four, and then it goes to five. There's no six and it goes to seven and then it goes all the way down to ten so there is spaces between the three and five and the spaces between the five and the seven but the downside is it's really hard to read and you can kind of see that right like it's very hard for you to see the lines here the michigan o probe is like this and it has um measurements of three six and eight so it ends at eight millimeters. So if someone has a deeper pocket, like more than eight millimeter, this might not be the, the good probe, a good probe for it, because it ends at eight millimeter. Then we have the UNC um, 12 and the UNC 15 probe. And when you look at this, it has all the um, markings here. So if you look at the UNC 12 one, it has, um, it, you can literally see all the lines from one all the way up to 12. And it's color coded, you can see the dark um black band at four millimeters and at nine millimeters but the unc 15 this one it's longer so you it can go all the way up to 15 um, millimeters so it's called unc 15 because it goes up to 15 millimeters this is unc-12 because it goes up to 12 millimeters so 15 means it can go deeper so if you have a very deep deep pocket a client with a deep pocket significant attachment loss then this might be the one to use there is this type of probe right here, the Novatec probe, and you can see it's quite um, angular. It's like it has an angled bend. It's mostly for the distal surfaces. It kind of feels bulky um, because of this angulation that you see, but it's only used for distal surfaces in the posterior side. And then we have the PSR, and the PSR is um, the one that has a ball tip at the very end tip, and it does have markings. So the color-coded one is from 3.5 millimeters to 5.5 millimeters. Um, refer back to my perio videos where I do go over how to use the PSR probe. This is the neighbor's vacation probe. You can see the curved, um, the round, tapered, and curved working end. And then for implants, we do have some plastic probes. Um, things to keep in mind is that with the plastic probe the markings do wear away so it's important that you replace or throw away these um, plastic probes if it is worn away 
Here we see a frication probe, a neighbor's probe that is used, and it goes in. And remember, if it goes in halfway, then it is a class two. So just review the classifications for frication if you can't recall. But remember, the probe that I want you guys to know are is the neighbor's probe. And it's used in areas where there are two or more roots. So your molars. When we're looking at treatment instruments, um, so we just looked at assessment instruments, which included the mouth, the explorer, and the probe. Now we're looking at treatment instruments, and the treatment instruments we typically use are um, curettes. They could be universal, and they could be area-specific. And let's look, look at um, these type of instruments. So the first thing I want you guys to know is let's look at the difference between a universal curette and compare it to a Gracie curette or an area-specific curette. What you'll notice is in the universal, look at the um, the shank. It is 90 degrees, right? The base, this base right here, this is the base of the curette, is right alongside the, um, the shank. So it's like a 90 degree right here, and then it comes out, so it's 90 degree right here. But when you look at the um, greasy, what you'll notice is that this it's tilted, right? If you look at the base, Right here on the working end, it does tilt, it offsets a little bit. It offsets at actually a 70 degree angle, 70 degree angle to its shank. One thing to note is with the universal, you have double cutting edges. You have this side is sharp, and this side is sharp. So there's two cutting edges. Whereas with the area specific, the gray secret, you only have one cutting edge. The lower side is your cutting edge, it's the sharp side, it's the side you want adapted against your against the client's teeth. So which of the following instruments, treatment instruments, are best designed for debriding very narrow and deep perio pockets? So keyword, narrow and deep perio pockets. Here are your options. C is the correct answer, micro mini five curette. So let's look at what, what all this. So just to recap, actually, you know what? Let's look at all these type and then we'll come back to this question to understand why it's the micro one and not any other ones. This is the standard greasy curette. Look at the shank. Okay. It's not as long as the other shanks. When you look at the other, the after five, so when it says five, 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 it means it's a longer shank. It is actually three millimeters longer compared to our regular greasy curette. Okay, so it is, this is this size of the shank and this size. When you have the five in the word, it is three millimeters longer than this. Let's look at the after five curette. So the after five curette, it is three millimeters longer than a standard greasy curette. But if you look at the working end, it is the same size as this. The mini, okay, is, if you look at the working end, it is mini, it is smaller than our regular standard Gracie curette. And the micro mini means it's even more smaller than the, um, than the mini five. So it gets even more smaller. If you look at the working end here, it gets even more smaller. So when you have a narrow, narrow pocket and a deep pocket, you want one that says five because five means that it's a deeper pocket. Sorry, it's a deeper shank. It's a longer shank. So you're able to get in deeper. And then when it says narrow, you want the most narrowest uh, working end, which is this one, because you want it to go inside that very narrow pocket. So the smallest or tiniest working end is the micro mini five. So that's why this is the best answer. Because the micro mini five blade width is 20% smaller than the micro five sorry, then the mini five curate. Um, and it is actually 50%, so the micro mini five is actually 50% smaller than the regular, I said, greasy curate. And it also has a long terminal shank. So this is your best one for narrow um, pockets. This one would be good for deep pockets, but if you want to have, if you have a narrow pocket, this would be more ideal. In Darby, there are great tables, so 28.4, to 28.8. These tables are really good. Actually, let me show you them. So this, this is from Darby. This is a table from um, Darby table 28.4 and it talks about the universal curette where we know it's double-ended um, because there's the both sides have cutting edges. So it tells you the main uh, specifications or the main design that you find in all in all universal curettes and then it shows you pictures of the various um, universal curette and what they are used for. So you'll notice here that they have like a, sh a short shank, 
um, and they're more rigid. If you look at it, it's more thicker, it's more rigid. So it's good for anterior tooth surfaces and for shallow probing dust because they have a short shank. But if you look at um, th these curettes, they have a long lower shank. So if they have a long lower shank, we know, and if it's more bendy, the more bent the shank is, it's easier to go more posterior, right? And it tells you which ones are good for buccal and lingual. So you can see that I would um, actually encourage you to look at these tables and see um, when you can use each type of universal curette. There's also the area-specific curette, okay? And we know the area-specific curette is unique because they only have one working end, one the cutting edge, rather. And again, if I show you some pictures, here we go. So the greasies are your area specific. You can see that they, in this table, they go over what they're used for and what their advantages and disadvantages are. And one thing I want you guys to know is the smaller the number, that means the more anterior, um, when you have a smaller number, it's good for anterior teeth. But when you have a higher number like 11 12 15 16 13 14 17 18 that's good for posterior teeth so the higher the number it's for posterior the lower the number it's for anterior so the one two that's the smallest number we have that is for anterior when you have something midway like the five six seven eight perhaps that could be for premolars and then when you go to like 11 12 all the way to 17 18 that is for the um, posterior molars So again, we see this here. When you have small numbers, it's more for um, incisor teeth. But when you have larger numbers, then it could be used for more posterior teeth. And they all have their unique surfaces that they have to work with. So 13, 14, or 17, 18 are for the distals. 11, 12, or 15, 16 are for the mesial. So that's important to note as well. Now, when we're looking at sickles, You'll notice that sickles have two cutting edges, which means it's sharp on both sides. So both sides could be adapted depending on where you are in the mouth. Um, and it could be a straight sickle, or it could be a curved sickle. And they come in the shank. So the shank, which is this area here, could be straight. That's what I'm sorry, that's what I was trying to say. Straight, it could be, um, you know, curved as well or contour angled. So even the shank is different with sickles. So there's lots of different sickles that we see here. There's files that you have to know about. So files are, the purpose of having files are to crush and break up any moderate or heavy subgingival calculus. Okay, so that's what it is. And it's very similar to a hoe scaler, if you've heard of hoe. Um, so it's make sure you're adapted, make sure, they, they do have sharp corners here, right? So you want to make sure that you're correctly adapted uh, when you're doing the activation, when you're trying to crush and break up the sub G calculus. These are the vocation instrument. This is the neighbor's probe. Okay, it's never to use for removing calculus. Remember that it is to assess for vocation. And you can see it has three millimeter markings. So you can see how you know deep the vocations are. So every color code is three millimeter markings. Scalers for implants. So this is a Hugh Freedy one, but there is like, and this is made of titanium, but um, there are like, it could be made out of plastic, it could be made out of graphite, gold, this is titanium. So they're all used to um, remove biofilm that's around the titanium implant and perhaps even calculus if that. Usually calculus don't really bind to implant, but if it does, these are the instruments that you can use. Tactile sensitivity is an important term to note because tactile sensitivity is. Um, feeling the vibrations transmit from your fingers um, to the handle. Actually, basically, you're, sen you're sensing the vibrations from the instrument to, uh, to, your, to, your, to your fingers. Sorry, not to the handle, to the clinical clinician's fingers on the handle. And that helps when you can, che you, know, you can check to see, is it smooth, is it rough? And the tactile sensitivity, the vibrations help you feel that. Sharpening, as we know, is extremely, extremely important. We have to make sure the blade is sharp um, because when it, the blade is sharp, it's going to decrease your, your fatigue. You're going to feel so much better. You don't have to scrape at it. So like, you know, for a long period of time, we don't have to debride in that one area for a long period of time because if it's sharp, it's going to come off easily. The, the calculus or tartar will come off easily. So as the first sign of dullness, if you notice that it's not sharp, and you will notice as the more you practice, the more you'll get this, start sharpening your instrument or find a sharpened instrument. And to sharpen instruments, there are many stones. There's the Arkansas stone, 
there's the India stone and there's the ceramic stone. So um, the main difference between these stones is that this stone right here, the Arkansas stone, this is a natural stone with fine texture. So it's fine texture. So it's good for people who are newbies, so for um, new hygienists um, that are uncomfortable with sharpening because it's, it's fine. It won't, it won't disrupt the um, instrument as much. These ones right here, the India stone one, it's also a natural stone. Um, it comes in medium texture. And so sometimes what they do is they use this um, stone first and then they follow up with the Arkansas stone to get a polished edge to their instruments. And this is your ceramic stone. When you're sharpening, uh, there are two techniques. There is, you could either move the instrument over the stone. So this is where the stone is flat and you're just rubbing the instrument or moving the instrument along the stone. This is um, could be done for sickles. But some, most of the time, this is probably what you learned where you're sharpening by moving, by literally moving the stone up and down. So there are two methods. You could, depending on what instrument you have, you could move the um, instrument up and down the sharpening stone or you could take the sharpening stone and move that up and down over the instrument. The other thing it states over here is that there are lots of devices that can do, um, uh, that can automatically, you know, sharpen your instruments, but the ones that we learn in school, are the manual sharpening techniques, which is typically this one. When you test for sharpening, um, or when you test to see if your instrument is sharp, remember the plastic stick that we use. So it's important that um, you have a light when you're looking at it, because the strong light helps to see if it's sharp. Also, tactile test. So when you you know put it on the um, hard plastic stick, you want to make sure that it is. Uh, it, you hear that click and it does, you know, catch, does catch on that stick. And auditory stands for you want to hear that click. You want to hear that noise to show that it is sharp. You don't want it just to slide over. If it does, it's it's a dull instrument. Now, what happens if, um, actually, by the way, did you guys know Explorer can also be sharpened? So you could do two or three rotations around the tip of on the stone and it does, um, Explorer can be sharpened. Now, what if your instrument breaks? What do you do? Remember, if your the if your instrument is too thin, discard it because the last thing you want to do is for it to break in someone's mouth. So it's be proactive and discard that instrument if it if the chip has become too thin. Now here's a question about what can happen if some if something breaks if a tip breaks. A dental hygienist is scaling the posterior mandibular right quadrant. Suddenly, the tip of the working end of the instrument, 13, 14 area specific curette, breaks. Which of the following is not an appropriate part of the initial tip retrieval procedure? So have a look and tell me what you think. Yeah, it is B. So um, we can re-instrument that area with another curette and see if that the broken curette comes out. So that's what that refers to. We, we get another curette and see if we can scoop out the broken um, tip. You could, in, you definitely have to tell your client about the breakage. There are magnetic tip instruments such as a period which. Um, a period retriever where you could, you, it's magnetic, so it's able to, you know, bring out the broken tip through a magnetic tip, but you never want to dry the area with compressed air because what can happen? The broken tip could move from that area where it is and it could the client it could be pushed to the back of the client's mouth and the client can easily swallow or aspirate it. And so finding it could be more difficult if you dry the area with compressed air. So never do that when there's a broken tip in, in your client's mouth. What you want to do is you want to tell your client Stop using any low speed or high speed because what you want to do is you want the client to spit it out. So give the client a, a cup and tell them to spit and we're hoping that it would come out in their saliva. And then if it does get recovered, make sure you inform the client, show the client so the client physically sees it and document it. But there are times when you won't be able to um, get it out. Let's say it, it doesn't come out. Then what do you do? Well, then you could use a magnetic tip perio retrievers to draw and grab the tip fragment. You some, um, you know, if you're at a period office, you might do an open blob periodontal surgery and find it 
in that gun. You could use wager graphic imaging, so take an x-ray and see if you can find where the missing tip is, and then once you know, then you can uh, take it out. And if you absolutely still can't find it, then they need to do a chest radiograph, a chest x-ray, to make sure that they haven't aspirated that tip. So then you must do a, ch a chest x-ray if you still cannot find it after taking the radiographs, after looking visually, after using the magnetic tip remover um, to, to you know take out the tip. So last resort, chest radiograph. But you have to find it. At some, you have to find it and you have to document it. So if you can't find it, then you have to do a chest radiograph or tell the client to do a chest radiograph. So document any instrument tip breakage uh, break it by noting the specific to the site, um, incident disclosure to the client with, sign with signature verifications to get them to sign um, where you have, you know, and you disclosed everything that happened, what the client said. So you want to note what the client's response was. And if you're doing any follow-ups or referrals, note that as well. Very important. Be as specific and detailed as possible. This is the modified pen graphs, which is the most common graphs we use for hand activated instrument. Notice the C shape, it's a nice, comfortable, you know, relaxed C shape. Notice that the thumb pad is placed on the instrument handle, the index finger is also placed on the instrument at a higher, uh, you know, on the, on the handle as well, and the middle finger is placed on the shank towards the working end. So this is the most common grasp, the standard grasp we use for dental hygiene instrumentation. Um, so fulcrum, as you know, is very important. We must fulcrum at all times. Even when we're using a cavature on a piezo, we are always fulcruming. You could do an intraoral fulcrum where you're fulcruming inside the mouth, or you could do an extraoral fulcrum where you're fulcruming outside the mouth. Now, when we're looking at um, instrument insertion, so how you put the instrument inside your client's mouth, we have to look at, we have to understand these three terms, angulation, adaptation, adaptation sorry, and activation. So let's um, look at this first. When you um, angle the instrument, so when you put the instrument inside the sulcus, the important thing is that insertion angle has to be close to zero degrees. Look at that. The face is against the tooth. The face of the instrument is against the tooth. It is at zero degrees, as we see here. This is ideal for the insertion of working end. Once it is inserted, then you can open the instrument. And um, it can be anywhere from 45 to, let's see, it's here, anywhere from 45 um, to 90. But Ideally, the best one is anywhere from 60 to 80. So 70. 70 would be the perfect way. So you, you put the instrument in, you insert it. The instrument is closed, right, against the tooth. Then you open the instrument so that it's at 60 to 70, 60 to 80, so 70 degree angle. If you do 45 degree angle, that is too close to remove calculus and burnishing. You'll burnish the um, calculus. If you do 90 degree angle, that is too open and you could damage the tissues on the other side. So 70 degree or 60 to um, 80 degree is your best type of angulation for removing calculus. And that's what we see here. Here's the tooth surface. This is at 70 degree angle, 60 to 80. And anywhere in that shaded area is good for you to remove the calculus that's sitting there. So when inserting a curette into a perio pocket, what is the ideal angle between the cutting edge of the blade of the instrument and the tooth. Yeah, it is zero, zero to 10 degrees. So you want it to be as close to the tooth as possible upon insertion. What about, what degree of angulation should be established between the roots, sorry, between the tooth surface and the cutting edge of the instrument blade when calculus is removed? So for calculus removal, what is the degree of angulation we want? 70 degrees, right, or 60 to 80 degrees. This is what we want. This is perfect to remove calculus. This 45 is not good because it will burnish the calculus. 90 is too open. It's going to damage the um, adjacent tissues. So 70 or 60 to 80 is your best one. Adaptation, so we look at angulation. Adaptation is just, it means touch, like how the instrument touches D2, so just the touch. Adaptation is a fancy word 
for touch and activation is the actual activation the actual movement that you're doing when you are debriding okay so when you're using your your forearm your wrist your hand and your fingers all of it as one you're using it as a one um it's all you know one movement that you're using when you're doing the instrument activation so you could have an exploratory stroke which is really really light stroke where and this is typical when you use an explorer or a probe you can have a scaling stroke this is used to scale off calculus and you could have a root planing stroke and root planing basically means you're removing calculus that has been embedded into the cementum or you're smoothening out the roots okay so scaling is when you're removing calculus root planing is when you're removing calculus from the cementum that has been embedded into the cementum all right so how do you know what curette to use here's one question for you which of the following instruments is the best choice for light to moderate subgingival calculus removal so keyword light to moderate sub g cal universal curette that is what's designed for light to moderate. So many times we have very little, um, you know, light calculus or light to moderate calculus, a universal curette would do. Sickle is for supra, so this is saying sub, a chisel. This actually here is a chisel. And a chisel is um, used for dislodging large bridges of calculus, especially in the interproximal area. So that's what it's for. And it's not for, so it's for large bridges of calculus. That has nothing to do with light to moderate subgingival calculus. The universal is the best one for just light to moderate sub-G cal calculus. But what about this one? The dental hygienist is scaling a sextant, teeth number 28 through 31. In FDI, that is 44247. The areas have five to six millimeter pocket, light sub-G calculus, and bleeding on probing. Which of the following is the best instrument, would be the best instrument to use to deprive the pockets in this area? So same options as before, but here what we have are um, pockets that are deep, bleeding on probing. So this person is um, probably has perio, right? Because when you see deep pockets there, definitely, they definitely have perio. Anytime when you have four millimeter pockets or more with bleeding, they are a perio client. So if you have a perio client, a client who's periodontally involved, what type of scaler would be best? The area specific. That is good for period clients. So slight to severe period clients who receive, who require scaling and root planing, this is good. Okay, this one is for someone who maybe you know we don't have enough information to say that they have period or not. So universal curette is our first type of instrument to use if they have light to moderate sub G cal. Then if they're more perio involved, then we use the area specific curette. And again, Darby has this a table 28.5, which tells you exactly what instrument to use depending on what type of calculus someone has. So I do encourage you to look at that. And when you are instrumentation, when you are doing instrumentation, remember um, these things. If the fulcrum doesn't feel right, find a different fulcrum. So it's okay to alter your fulcrum. Um, and with experience, adjustments are made within seconds. Because remember, when you're probing, let's say you're probing a, um, say you're probing a tooth on this side, you can have a three millimeter pocket or probing depth, and on this side, you could have on the distal, you could have a ten millimeter probing depth. So remember that probing depths do change, and so when you have in an area that is more periodontally involved, like this ten millimeter side, you're gonna have to fulcrum further away from the working side so it's you know it's really important that you are comfortable with your fulcruming because sometimes you need to fulcrum further away from the the actual tooth especially if they're more periodontally involved this is a dental um, perioscopy and this is actually really cool what happens here is that they have like a light that is attached to a dental and endoscope and and it's and there's a camera and you can actually go in with that endoscope with the perioscopy and you can actually see in the camera where exactly the calculus is. So it allows for subgingival visualization um, of where the calculus is. So it's really cool. Technology has come a long way. 
Now let's look, look at ultrasonic instrumentation. And what I'll do here is I'll just look at the questions. We'll do some questions so that you're able to understand and grasp the important mm -hmm. concepts that you should know. So here's our first question. All of the following are contraindications for the use of mechanic, uh, mechanized instrument, except one. Which one is the exception? So when do you not have to um, worry when you're using a cavitron or a piezo? Your answer, oh sorry, that was circled too big, but your answer is B. So when someone has a pulmonary disease, a pulmonary disease is, think of like, like um, asthma, emphysema, cystic fibrosis, pneumonia, anything that puts them at risk, or anything where the lungs are involved, you don't want to use Cavitron or piezo. So you don't want to use ultrasonic. What does dysphagia mean? Dysphagia means difficulty swallowing. So if someone has difficulty swallowing, you're not going to use a cavitron because with cavitron, there's lots of water that is involved. But a communicable disease like hepatitis, TB, strep throat, COVID, respiratory infections, yes, that could be transmitted with aer um, through aerosols. And we use standard precautions to um, meet the infection control guidelines. But basically, the point here is that when you have a client with communicable disease, don't treat them. Don't treat them until you talk to a doctor because it, it's contagious. So um, the thing here is that we're not going to treat them regardless. They're not necessarily contraindications. It's just we're not going to treat them. But the other ones are contraindications because the lungs are involved or they have difficulty swallowing. This one is your um, the answer here. That if someone has a communicable disease, we don't do any debridement until the disease has been treated for an appropriate length of time as determined by the doctor. When you have an ultrasonic, um, when you're using an ultrasonic instrumentation, there are uh, four mechanisms of action. There's the mechanical, the actual physical movement of the cavitron. So when you're moving the cavitron, that's the mechanical physical movement. That's what that's referring to. Irrigation is the water. The water is flushing out um, any, you know, it's flushing out. It could be flushing out blood, it could be flushing out biofilm, it could be flushing out debris, but the irrigation is the water that is used with the ultrasonic instrument. And the reason why we use water is to counteract the heat that is generated from the instrument tip. Cavitation is when you have a bubble that gets popped, and that pop and when it when it pops and gets released, um, it, it forces the basically it forces there's a there's a there's an act. There's a forceful act that comes on, on the surface. It's like a jet, basically. And so cavitation is with the collapse of a bubble that does the work for ultrasonic instrumentation. And then we have acoustic microstreaming, and that's basically the, the swirling of the water, the vigorous swirling of the water um, that's happening here. And that is very helpful with, um, with debridement. Okay, so we have mechanical, which is the physical remove, the physical rem action of using a cavitron. We have irrigation, where the water comes out uh, to counteract the heat. We have cavitation, which is the bubbles that get popped, it's microscopic bubbles that get popped and, and does the action. And we have acoustic microstreaming, um, which is where you get the movement in the liquid. When magnostrictive, when magnetostrictive ultrasonic instrumentation is used, the function of the water that circulates through the handpiece and exits as a spray at the working end is which of the following? So why do we have water? Yeah, we have water to um, cool down the tip. And so if your client is saying that, oh, it feels so hot, up the water intake, the water, there probably isn't enough water. Water doesn't help with lubricating. The instrument itself doesn't need lubrication. The water flow doesn't reduce bleeding. Uh, sorry, reduces bleeding. Like you, you, it'll wash away the bleeding, but it doesn't stop the bleeding. And um, the water doesn't destroy or disrupt bacteria. Acoustic microstreaming is a term that describes the potential to destroy or disrupt bacteria. So water is a byproduct, the water basically is needed to cool the system down. One of the major differences between the piezo ultrasonic instrument and the magnostrictive ultrasonic instrument is which of the following?
Yes, the answer is B. So the activated surface of the working end is different. So let me show you what that means. This is a cabotron. This is a piezo. With a cabotron, all surfaces are active. So the lateral side of the surfaces, the back, the face, all of those work. So if you have any side of the cabotron adapted to the teeth, um, it will work. It will remove the calculus. But the piezo, only the lateral side, so only the sides are active, which means that when you adapt it, when you touch, when you keep the instrument or bring the instrument and touch it towards the tooth, the side has to be adapted. Only the sides, not the back, not the face, only the sides can, can work. This over here is saying the stroke pattern is, you know how there's like movements that are happening here? So the movement that is happening is elliptical here. Um, where it looks like this and here the movement is side to side linear that's the movement that's being transmitted in the ultrasonic this right over here frequency what this refers to is how many times the um, vibration is happening in um, per minute so for example 20 khz which is kilohertz it stands for there is 20,000 strokes per second. So imagine that. So any the magnostrictive, the amount of strokes that's happening is quite, um, you know, it's anywhere from 20 to 40,000 strokes per second, per second, I should say. And piezo is 29 to 50, so it's higher um, kilohertz, which means that there could be up to 50,000 strokes per, in, per second. So a lot of movement, a lot of strokes is happening um, when we are using a piezo. It can go up to 50, which is, you know, quite impressive. All right, so when we're looking at ultrasonic tips, it could be standard, it could be thin, or it could be, sorry, slim, or it could be ultra slim. And I have a question on that, and then we're gonna look at pictures of these th three different types of tips. Precision thin inserts are designed and indicated for which of the following? So the answer is light perio. Uh, periodontal root debridement. So sometimes you can just um, look at it through process of elimination where um, if you see heavy calculus and if you see ortho cement, you know that that's quite heavy. Um, so it can't be these two because they're they're kind of similar. What you're lo looking for here is when you have a thin insert, you don't want to use a thin insert for heavy calculus because you could you know break that insert. And ortho cement, that's quite strong. A thin insert won't remove ortho cement because it could break. And extrinsic tooth stain, extrinsic tooth stain, you could use um, a standard insert. You don't need to use a thin insert for the stain. But when you have light perio root debridement, so you have light calculus, a thin insert will do. Thin inserts are designed for light perio debridement. They're good for, you know, subgingival, you can access subgingivally easily if clients find it more comfortable. And even with tactile sensitivity, you're able to trans the vibration you're able to feel. So thin inserts are narrow and um, in uh, than standard design. They're narrow in diameter. And they generally use um, less power and frequency than the standard inserts. So let me show you this picture. This is, let's see here. These are our, um, the ones, the tips, you can see they're a little thicker. They're, they're designed, the standard one, you could say, they are designed for um, heavier deposits. But when you have the slim insert like this, and we also have another thin insert like that. You can see that it's a lot more thinner. This is actually very thin. This is 30% thinner than the regular insert. This is good for subgingival calculus, for light to moderate um, calculus. This also is really good for just, you know, plaque, just biofilm and even light calculus as well. But when you have moderate to heavy calculus, you want to use a thicker tip because it's able to remove the deposit more effectively. Let's look at another question. Which of the following best describes the water spray that is recommended when precision thin inserts are used for non-surgical periodontal therapy? Non-surgical periodontal therapy refers to debridement. Okay, when you think of this word, think of debridement. I know it also refers to education um, as well, and nutritional counseling, tobacco cessation, all that, but non-surgical periotherapy in this case is referring to debridement. So what is the best water spray that we wanna see when we're using our um, ultrasonic. 
This is the answer. We want very fine droplets of water and a very fine mist or spray. Okay, it's kind of it's known as out of phase tuning. Um, so the water spray is adjusted out of phase and it should appear as a fine mist with a water drip. This is how a clinician knows that the tip is not tuned to resonance frequency for maximum energy output. I'm just reading the rationale for you here. Um, basically, you just want very fine droplets. You don't want large droplets of water. You don't want a narrow, um, steady stream of water because you want a steady stream with droplets of water. Okay, so you shouldn't just see a stream. You need to see droplets plus a stream. And you don't need a narrow stream of water covering a large area. That means the client's whole face is going to get wet. Um, it doesn't have to be a large area. It can just be an, a, a small area of spray. In which of the following ways could an ultrasonic tip cause an undesirable surface alteration? Think about when it can, um, like maybe damage the root. What could happen for it? What could you do to damage the root, to damage the surface? What do you think? Yeah, it is C. So um, if the point of the, in, of the insert of the tip is adapted to the tooth, and then you could basically gouge the root. You could gouge like that area, and you know, and that that can cause damage. The point is not, you know, your point should not be adapted. It should be the side, or, or if you're using a piezo, for example, it should be the lateral sides. If the power setting is too low, that's not going to damage anything. If the water spray is too great, I mean, it'll make you wet, but it's not going to damage. Water doesn't damage the surface. If you use light pressure, you're not going to damage the surface. Heavy pressure, yes, you'll damage it. But if you use a point, the tip of the insert. Um, it can definitely gouge the root. One thing to note is when you are looking at the ultrasonic tip, if you see two millimeter of the tip length has been lost, throw it away, replace it. Okay, so that's how you know when to change an ultrasonic tip, when two millimeter of the tip length is lost. Here's another question. Which of the following is an indication for using a standard ultrasonic insert? I'll let you read it and you tell me what you think. The answer is B, to moderate to heavy super gingival calculus in a young adult accompanied by tobacco stain. This is when you want to use a standard ultrasonic insert. All the other ones are when you want to use thin inserts. So for example, if they have light calculus, a thin insert will do. You don't need a standard heavy thick one. If they have fine deposit, a thin one will do. If they have light stain and fine sub G cal, um, so sub gingival calculus, a thin insert will do, right? So this is process of elimination. You can see that this one has the word light um, subgingival calculus. This one has the word fine subgingival calculus. This one also has the word fine. So it can't be these. These one says moderate to heavy. None of the other ones said moderate to heavy. So therefore it has to be B. So standard ultrasonic inserts are good for moderate to heavy subgingival calculus. When you're using an ultrasonic instrumentation, when you insert um, the tip, what you want to do is you want to be as close to the tooth as possible, anywhere from 0 to 15 degrees, but the closer the better. So 0 degrees is ideal. Okay, so you want to be as close to the tooth as possible. So 0 degree angulation is ideal. Just like a probe. When you're probing, you're using the same type of movement. Um, with the probe, you're very close to the tooth, 0 to 15 degrees. And this is for manual instrumentation. So anywhere from 45 to 90 degree, but typically you want to be right in the middle. So 70 degrees, 60 to 70 degree is your ideal um, angulation for manual instrumentation. For ultrasonics, it's anywhere from 0 to 15, ideally 0. When you're using ultrasonic instrumentation, it is recommended by Darby that you do sectant by sectant. It's more efficient than doing it by quadrant because you're not changing um, your position, your operator's position. You're not really changing the tips as often as well. So work sectant by sectant. It's easier on you. And also advance toward operator. So what that means is start with the tooth that's furthest away from you and then come closer to you. So if you're starting, start with the third molar, then go to the second molar, then the first molar, then the premolar. So you're working farther away from you more you're looking at a treatment area that is most distant from you and then it's going to come closer and advance towards you